I think we're live. Hey guys, sorry if there was a little confusion because I scheduled the live show for an hour later than it was supposed to be. I was confused, <laughs> but it's now. Um, and hopefully, it doesn't look like anyone has joined us yet, but hopefully some people will. And uh, for those of you guys who are watching this later, as a reminder, this is a spoilery live show. So if you haven't read Knife of Dreams, you probably don't want to watch this. But we're going to be talking about all the things that happened in Knife of Dreams today. So, oh, yeah, we have four viewers. Yay. Yeah. Um, do you just want to start with our overall thoughts? And you can go first. I'm going to pull up the chat and stuff real quick while you talk. Um, so I think that this book was, it definitely had some important stuff going on. But I feel, yeah, I feel like overall it was a little bit slower than some of the other ones. But really there was enough, like, really important stuff that happened that kind of. What it was slower? That's really funny. I didn't think that. But keep going. Maybe it's because I've already read the majority of book two and that one's like extremely fast paced. Oh, um, the next one, it's, it's more fast paced. Because I looked at my notes for book 11 and then I looked at my notes for book 12 and my notes for book 12 are way longer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think whatever you have like read recently definitely affects that because I, you know, the last book that I read was book 10 and like this was significantly more interesting than book 10. That's for I sure. agree. I definitely do agree. Yeah. Um, so I really, really liked it. I like, I feel like every single chapter had something interesting going on that I was like, Oh, what is this? And the other thing is that like, we're so far into the series, even though it's technically a reread for me that I, I, there's a few things that I know that haven't happened yet, but most of the things that happened were like surprises. And I was like, um, you know, there weren't, there weren't twists, but like things that I wasn't expecting and stuff, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Overall, I really like this book. I, um, I mean, I read most of it this past week and it was just, it was, had me enthralled the whole time. I just constantly was like, what's going to happen next? So I was really excited about it. Yeah, I think the most entertaining aspect of it was um, Egwene being stuck in the White Tower and um, that entire thing, because we kind of, not only do we get more White Tower time when we didn't really get to see what goes on in the White Tower before, mm -hmm. but, um, but also it was a lot, um, yeah, that, that entire um, aspect of the story was just really entertaining and really like weird. Were you surprised that she didn't want to be rescued? I was pretty surprised, yeah. Um, it's it's also kind of weird to me that she not only had to be a, an accepted again, like she had to be a novice again. And so right. that doesn't that, make sense. <laughs> like that surprised me the most because I kind of thought that, you know, even if they didn't um, think that her being Aes Sedai was um, legitimate, you know, she passed that accepted test fair and square. It seems kind of weird that she would have to go all the way back to being a novice again all of a sudden. Well, I think that's just Elida, like, on her power trip and just wanting to change all these rules that have been in place for such a long time. So, which I think kind of works in Egwene's favor because she's trying to, like, talk to the other Aes Sedai about how Elida is doing things she's not supposed to and she's like you know she's trying to instigate a rebellion from inside the tower so i think her being made into a novice which goes against all those rules helps her with that too mm, i think you're right yeah yeah and i thought i so i mean i've always liked Egwene, but i didn't like feel that strongly about her, but I really liked her in this book, the way that she was like rebelling and taking all of those beatings and like doing things that she knew would get her more beatings just to show like how strong she was. I really like that. Yeah, like she was, she's very clever in this book. Like she yeah. gotten more, like more and more kind of strategic in her thinking and whatnot as yeah. it went on. I think that started in the last book when she kind of like, made the rebellion uh, hall of the tower kind of do what she wanted uh so it started in the last book but she really shined in this one i feel like yeah, she really she really shines on this one for sure mm -hmm. I think that um 
at the beginning of the series, Egwene is kind of supposed to be just like, oh, that that little young girl who so naive thing, and she like doesn't, and she's like that. She's like that character who there's always like that one person who's like that person who like you don't think is gonna do anything or whatever, but then she becomes this really like badass person as the story goes on. Yeah, no, her character progression has been pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so my favorite part or like storyline out of this book was probably Matt's storyline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I like Matt to begin with anyways, but I was so excited that he had finally met up with the daughter of the nine moons in the last book and to see like where they were at the beginning of this book to the end when she finally like says that he's her husband and he like defeats the, Sh the Shan Chan that are rebelling and stuff. Like I just, that whole storyline, I loved it. Yeah, I loved it too. Yeah. Uh, someone in the chat, Sir Book Sage said, putting Egwene back down to the novices is a critical error in the White Towers part. You can see Elida's rule is unsustainable, so her downfall is inevitable. Exactly, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Um, that it, it kind of helps bring down Elida's rule. He said, letting Egwene build her own alliance from the ground up from the novices, which I love that part, at the same time as working on the Aes Sedai from the top down will be a fateful mistake. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I cannot wait for Elida's downfall. Like, <laughs> I've been <laughs> waiting for it and it's finally coming closer, so. Um, just for the people in the chat, if you guys have any things that happen in this book that you want us to talk about, feel free to, you know, let us know so we can discuss it. But yeah, so going back to Matt's storyline and um, him and Tuan, like, she, he's obviously in love with her. And I, like, laughed so hard. There was one scene where it was Satel Anon was talking with Matt. Um, it's a scene where he found out that she used to be an Aes Sedai and that she um, had been, uh, what's the word, stilled. She'd been stilled in her previous life, I guess, which surprised me. Like, there had been all these hints that she had been been to the tower, but, like, they didn't know. And she had said before that she, like, couldn't channel, or I guess some, maybe somebody else said that they could tell that she couldn't channel or something. But... Anyways, I was surprised to find out that she used to be an Aes Sedai. Like, that's pretty crazy. And I, I wonder what her name used to be. And if we've, I don't know, heard of her before? Probably not. But I feel like there's not that many Aes Sedai that get still. So maybe we have. I don't know. Um, anyways, he's talking to her. And she said something about, like, how half the reason why he, Satel Anon, decided to come with Matt was because she thought that Matt was like playing with Tuan's heart or something oh. and how he's like a rascal or like a player is basically how I interpreted it. And um, where was I going with that? Tuan, oh, and she's like, but then she can tell from Matt's face that he's like really in love with, and he says a couple things and she's like, whoa, you like, you really felt hard for this girl, right? And that just like made my heart so happy because he's like so in love with her. But then at the end, whenever Tuan finally says that they're married, he he's like, you're not acting like someone in love. And she's like, well, that's because I don't love you yet, <laughs> which I thought was so funny. No, that is really funny. Because yeah, I mean, also, I just love how completely opposite they are almost like, mm -hmm. they have totally different personalities, but they work so well together. Yes, I, Tuan is one of my favorite characters. And I think that they're probably my favorite. Rom I mean, they're not that romantic, but like my favorite romance, like I just I love them together. Yeah. We've got a couple more chats. Steve Miner said, this is a reread for me. Started reading originally in the 90s. Elida. Wish we could have had more in her head after her fall, if you know what I mean. I don't know what you mean, but I'm sure we'll find out. Um, Winston said, I believe she was burned out working with an object of the power. Oh, talking about Satel. That's cool. I mean, that's not cool. That sucks for her. But um, yeah, I wonder if we, maybe she's someone that we've heard about from whenever like they tell Egwene all the people who have been burned out working with um, objects or Tarangaral and stuff. Let's see, what other interesting things happened in this book? 
Well, you were right about Amasera um, and how she actually did escape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she has a really interesting progression too because, I mean, obviously she used to be Panark, but then she was made into a slave for the Shan Chan and they like totally broke her. And then now that she's with Julin, he's kind of been like rebuilding her self-confidence and stuff. And her relationship with Eganon is also really interesting because Eganon, her, she's changed a lot too. She's kind of not um, as faithful to the Empire anymore, I guess. And she's she's helping Amethera to also be more self-confident and stand up for herself. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about Rand and his meeting with the daughter of the nine moons. I did not know what was going to happen there. I was really confused. I was like, okay, well, we know where Tulan is. So I thought maybe Seroth was going to meet with Rand. So I was totally shocked at how that went down. So he shows up and he's prepared for it to be a trap. Um, even though it still doesn't go that great. And it turns out to be, um, of course I'm going to lose her name when I need it. She's one of the forsaken. I don't remember her name. It starts with an S, I think. It does start with an S. I don't, oh my gosh. It's, it makes me think of Sephiroth. It's Semirog. Semirog. Yeah, Semirog. So it's, yeah. So that was like a total shock to me. I was like, what? And then I thought he was going to be in so much trouble. Granted, they made it out, but he lost a hand. <laughs> like, that's terrible. Yeah. Like, like, I was thinking the same thing. I was totally thinking it was going to be, um, uh, Suroth and all that stuff. Yeah, especially since she's trying to yeah move on out of the picture somehow. Right, and she wanted to be... Well, and it, it kind of makes sense. Like, once it happened, I was looking back on our previous interactions with Suroth, and, I mean, I don't think we knew before this book that Suroth was a dark friend. But at the beginning of the book, we find out that Suroth is a dark friend and that she, and Sem I think Semarong comes to visit her and Semarong's the one who tells her, I want you to be the empress or whatever. So obviously Semarong has been working with the Shan Chan. I don't, maybe not working with them because she apparently killed everyone in the empire. <laughs> so that was interesting that the empress and everyone overseas is completely like dead and gone now. Um, and it just, it comes full circle at the end of the book when Seroth gets caught as being a dark friend. Well, I guess Tuan doesn't know she's a dark friend, but as a traitor to the Shan Chan. Um, so all of that kind of came full circle with the beginning of the book, starting with Seroth kind of telling us that she's a dark friend and then Semarok visiting her and saying that I want you to be Empress and we're going to kill Tuan. And then at the end of the book, Tuan shows up and like, is you know takes control of her position and everything was which was really cool it was also kind of interesting that um word had kind of spread about um tuan supposedly being an imposter basically yeah, that but, was Zuroff. He She was spreading that rumor because she, she wanted the people to kill Tulan. Yeah, I thought that was really weird. Yeah, it was weird. And I liked that. So the Death Watch soldier that came to find her with Matt is someone we've seen in his head a couple of times. Like we've been in his POV a couple of times in other books. Um, so it was cool to see like him as a reoccurring character and the fact that he like, knew that, or like, I guess I was gonna say he knew that Tuan wasn't an imposter, but that's because of who he was and everything. But yeah, I'm glad that there, that there was someone who was actually on, you know, part of the Shan Chan who actually knew what was going on and that he was able to find Matt. And I thought it was really funny. He just like walks in and he's like, I want to talk to Tom Marilyn. And they're just like, okay. <laughs> Even though they're obviously Death Watch soldiers and like, I thought for sure when he tried to walk into the camp that there would be some sort of skirmish or something. And then of course he like thinks that Tom is the mastermind behind all of this, which was hilarious. <laughs> uh, someone said, uh, Sebel McShave said, what did you think of the attack on the manor, on the manor and the confrontation between Rand and Luz Theron? Uh, that confrontation, well, okay, the attack on the manor surprised me. Like we have um, the Ogier, <clears throat> 
and getting married and things are like all happy and he looks out the window and he's like oh my god there's thousands of trollocs so that totally surprised me because i didn't see that coming um but yeah it there does suddenly seem to be um i mean there's always been trouble between rand and Luz in his head but was there and actually like took control of the power and Rand couldn't take it back. And Loghain after the attack was like, why are you still holding so much of the power? And Rand just kind of plays it off like he's doing it on purpose, but really he can't let it go because it's loose there. And like, that was scary. <laughs> yeah. It's like almost like we really don't know if Rand is just crazy or if um, Luz Theron is actually a different person inside of him. And it really seems more like the latter, whereas before it could easily have been either just like Right. Well, and then that when they get to the part where he meets Semarog, Semarog tells everybody that's there that sometimes people hear voices of people if, of their past lives. So she kind of like confirms that he is a real, a real voice in his head. <laughs> a real voice in his head. It almost yeah. sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm also still confused about why when Rand uh, like goes to take a hold of Sidine, he still gets really sick, even though they've cleansed it. So I wonder if that'll ever be explained. Well, because basically, I mean, he he already had started going crazy before the cleanse. Nobody else has that going on. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, so I don't know what that's about. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about like voices and things in uh, Rand's head, he keeps seeing this person who saved him when he was um, at Shatter Logoth, when he tried to kill Samael. And I thought for a while that that was Luce Theron. I feel like somebody told me that it's Morden, Morden, but like I don't really understand how that works. So I'm interested to see how that's going to play out. Do you have any guesses about who that is? Uh, no, not really. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was Luce Theron, but in this book it seemed more like they were talking like it was a third person. So I don't know. Um, someone, Yvonne asked, what do we think about Loghain? Um, I, for some reason, trust Loghain. I mean, I think because he's, like, made an opposition to Taim, and obviously we don't trust Taim, <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of why I trust Loghain, but, I mean, it is a little concerning that Min had that, you know, vision of him with the crown or something, or... I don't know if it was actually a crown or if it was like a metaphorical halo around his head or something, but like that he's destined for greatness. So that, that's a little concerning, but I think, I mean, he's done a lot of things to help Rand, especially against time. So I don't know. I trust him. Yeah. I think I do too. Yeah. Oh, uh, someone said the connection between Rand and the mystery man seems to have come from their bolts of balefire overlapping. Yes, I agree with that. I think they talked about that in the book. But I guess I'm confused because when I read that in the book, I was thinking it was... Well, I remember being confused about it when I read it too. <laughs> I was thinking that it was Luce Theron and that it was just like a vision, so it wasn't like he wasn't actually there. But I guess he was, and maybe it wasn't a vision because he actually helped him, like, get out, like, pulled him up off the ledge or something. So, I don't know. I'm interested to see how that gets resolved further. So, what did you think about Perrin's storyline in this book? Well... Yeah, I was excited that he finally saved Fayul. That was a <laughs> that long was time awesome. coming. <laughs> Um, it was interesting because it started out with him capturing, uh, Galena and Galena telling him that she was trying to save Fayil and, um, Perrin sends her back with a message to tell her like, you know, when, when this 
what does he say? When you see fog on the ridge and you hear wolves howling in the daytime, then you need to go to this place because that's the day that I'm going to save you. So I was like, oh, he has like a plan. That's exciting. And I um, I wasn't anticipating, well, I guess I should have been because I think they talked about it a little bit in the last book, but I forgot that he had decided he was going to work with the Sean Chan because um, Talonvor had come to him and Talonvor had like started working with the Sean Chan. Um, sorry, my phone is going crazy. I need to put it on do not disturb. Stop buzzing at me. But yeah, I was kind of surprised that he was working with the Sean Chan. Oh, and the Sean Chan said some really interesting things when they first met. So the Sean Chan, what, okay, so when Perrin was introduced, she was like, I'm glad you didn't introduce him as the Wolf King or something. And so she says all these things that um, are from their prophecies of the dragon that are obviously related to Perrin and Matt. Um, so like the Wolf King comment and said something about him carrying a hammer and then she says something about matt about like when the fox chases the raven and all of that which i thought was really interesting so i when i was reading her saying those things to him i was like oh my god that's so cool um someone said parent storyline against the shadow is like that part in my and Monty Python's Holy Grail, where the soldiers in the castle are watching the charging enemy forever, and then suddenly they attack, and <laughs> the attack just happens. Yeah, it happened pretty quickly. Um, well, there were a few build-up chapters, but yeah, for books, we've just been waiting for it to happen, so I'm glad that it, it finally happened. And it was apparently only like, it was less than 60 days, it was like 50-something days that she was captured, but it sure felt like forever. <laughs> No, it really did feel like forever. It felt mm -hmm. like a year. Oh, but when he when he finally found her, and um, she had been say like uh, what his name's just an R like Rodan or something. The um, the Aiel that had been kind of like protecting her, but also like trying to get her to sleep with him. So she he has her, and they're like walking. <clears throat> he has her by the arm and they run into Perrin and Perrin hits him on the head with a hammer and I was just like, oh my god, no. But then Fayel stabs him in the back. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? I mean, obviously she thought that he was gonna kill Perrin and like that wouldn't have been okay. But I was so shocked that she stabbed him. And then we were in Perrin's point of view at that point, and he said something about how he could smell that she was also sad and felt guilty, but also happy to see him at the same time. And like, it was cool because I could understand why she would feel all of those things, you know? Yeah, cause she, you know, she stabbed the guy who had tried to like help her and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And but, had, um, you know, protected her against a lot of the other Shido and stuff. So yeah, that was kind of sad to see. But then there was, so there was like three of those Aiel and two of them died. Um, because one of the other people with Fayil stabbed the other one, but one of them was holding Morghese, and he, like, didn't do anything about it. At least I thought it was one of the, maybe, I don't know, obviously there's a lot of named characters, and I might have been confused, but I thought it was one of the Aiel, like, I thought there was three of those men, and two of them died, and the one that didn't still stayed to help them. <laughs> I was like, okay, you just saw two of your friends get stabbed, and you're just like, okay to continue to help you guys i mean i'm glad but whatever <laughs> um okay so daniel green said it's it was only 50 days i thought it was like six months hot damn that pacing is off yeah it was because he was making knots on this rope and at the end it was like 57 days or something which was crazy Oh, and someone mentioned the sad resolution of Aram's story always gets me. Any feelings on the fallen tinker? I was shocked. I know that there have been hints that he had been spending too much time with um, with Masima and that he had been influencing him, but like Perrin has been with him for so long and had been like a role model for him and did it have Aram try to kill Perrin like that all of a sudden? I was pretty shocked and I was sad, but but I was glad that 
Perrin wasn't the one who had to kill Aram because there was Shido that like stabbed him in the back or whatever. So I was glad that it didn't have to be Perrin, but I was sad that it, it happened, obviously. Yeah, that is really sad. Yeah. Daniel said, I think it would have helped a lot to have more from Ar Aram's point, uh, perspective during that time. Yeah, it wouldn't have been as much of a surprise. Would have helped with the pacing and understanding his change. Agreed. Agree. Yeah. We had a lot of people in the chat, which is really exciting. Uh, <laughs> someone asked, Sir Book Sage asked, what do you think about Mazram Taim? I mean, I think he's, he's super evil. <laughs> That's what I think. I think he's a dark friend, obviously. Um, and I think that he has gathered a lot of um, a lot of his Asha men who are also dark friends. So at the end, in the epilogue, when Pavara and the, like the six red sisters come and, and talk to him and say that they want to um, bond people and he just starts like basically like laughing and saying yeah anybody you want to bond go for it you know that old saying let the lord of chaos rule and she was she hadn't heard that saying before and that's like a something that the you know that's coming straight from the um from Moradin and the other forsaken so i think that he is planning on letting a bunch of dark friends dark friend ashaman bond those six Aes Sedai, which kind of scares me because I really like Pavara. She's had a, like a really interesting role in the story. So Carr said, yeah, that prophecy part made me think back to your comment in the New Spring live show about the shadow possibly targeting blacksmiths, wondering if there was a connection between uh -huh. them. Too. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if there's something in the prophecy <clears throat> about Blacksmiths. Steve Miner said, in rereading those traumatic big events, you remember often end up you remember often end up being relatively short in the actual book. I agree. When I'm like rereading things, like way back in Lord of Chaos, when um, Rand was like captured and kept in that box, I thought that took a lot longer. Like I thought he was in the box a lot longer and there was a lot more like chapters or like more um, text from his perspective of him being like claustrophobic and stuff. But when I read it, it happened a lot faster than I thought it was. Someone said, one of my favorite scenes happens in this book. Nynaeve during the chapter, the Golden Crane talking to Lan, or taking Lan to the Borderlands and spreading the news about Melkir was just awesome. I totally agree. I was shocked that, that that she like let him go. Like I didn't remember this happening. Like I said, even though this is a reread, there's a lot of things that I, I don't remember at this point in the story. And so I was surprised that she let him go. And I, this is gonna sound silly, but when she, so she like takes him and drops him off and he's like wait we're i'm still like kind of far from where you said like what are you doing and she's just like bye <laughs> because he wants him to like take time to get there so that he can gather soldiers and then she goes to a bunch of different towns to like tell them that he's there and i kind of teared up when she was like talking to that merchant and was like as long as someone wears the hidori and somebody wears the whatever the dot on her head is like Malkir still lives and like she was like pep talking them and I kind of like teared up about it. I was it was really cool Gave me shivers <laughs> But yeah, I was surprised that she let Lan go I mean, I guess they've been together like in person for a little while now But I mean that's her husband and she's just gonna let him go away like that <laughs> No, that that was really surprising for sure. Yeah Um let me think. I don't remember how long they spent apart during that. Yeah, and I mean, Lan, I would think is still a little bit suffering from Moraine's death or whatever. Um, and he, you know, his whole reason for trying to stay alive was keeping Nynaeve alive, but I guess that maybe he feels better about that now, and now he really wants to go fight the shadow, I guess, I don't know. But I mean, I'm sure we'll meet up with him soon. But I thought it was interesting that he is so convinced that the that Tarman Gaiden is going to take place in the Borderlands. I mean, I guess it makes sense. 
but I also feel like it could take place almost anywhere. So I don't know. So what about Moraine? <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, it, I feel like it's basically confirmed that they're going to go save her. So that whole scene where um, Matt is talking to Tom and Matt's like, can I see, or he asks about the letter and Tom lets him see the letter. And then we get to read the whole letter. I was so <laughs> ecstatic. I wanted to know what was in that letter for ages. I constantly wanted to know what was in that letter and we finally get to read it. And it was just, it was so interesting. She was like, she even said, like, you can't show Matt the letter until he asks for it. And that's, like, exactly how it played out. Um, and, like, Matt knows where I am. And Matt was like, I don't know where she is. And then he was thinking about it. Um, and, of course, little Oliver is the one who pops up and is like, oh, yeah, the Aelfin and the Aelfin. You have to go to the Tower of Genji. And then Matt's like, I don't know where that is. And then Noel, who I'm very confused by. I have suspicions, which I'll talk about in a second, but Noel is, describes what the Tower of Den Genji looks like, and then Matt, like, remembers actually seeing it with Domon, so it's like, all the pieces are kind of falling into place, because Domon is there with them, it's not like they have to go find him or anything, and so I'm excited for that to happen, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm excited, and, okay, so back to Noel, so in the last book, or maybe the one before, Four, I think it was the last book, I was suspicious of him because I felt like his timing was a little too good when he saved Matt, and he seems to know all these things that he's not, so I thought he might be evil, but I have come around to think that he's not evil, and he keeps talking about Jane Farstrider. <clears throat> he has the same last name as Jane Farstrider. I mean, Farstrider isn't Jane's real last name, but whatever his, it's like Charin or something like that. So they have like the same last name and someone asked him at some point, like, are you his cousin uh, or are you related to him? I think he said he's a cousin or something. But now I think that he is Jane Farstrider. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps saying things like, I want to do things that Jane Farstrider never did. And I don't know. I feel like he's actually Jane Farstrider. But at the same time, I feel like that is silly that he wouldn't change his last name. So I don't know. Yeah. That does seem weird. But he keeps talking about things beyond the I.O. waste. Like, why would you know about that stuff? <clears throat> Another thing is that I thought that Jane Farstrider was, like, alive a long time ago. Like, I didn't think it was recent. But from the things that I read in this book, it seems like he didn't live that long ago. So, like, it is possible that Noel is him. Or maybe, like, Noel's his brother or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. That would be really odd. Yeah, and I mean, so that makes me think that maybe him finding Matt at just the right time is just like a Tavirin thing, and it was just like a coincidence, and that maybe I shouldn't be so suspicious of him. And he's like been a good guy so far that we've seen from him, so my suspicions of him being a dark friend or someone like a forsaken in disguise have kind of dissipated at this point. Makes sense. Yeah. Someone said, just think, the puzzle of the Tower of Genji has been building through the entire series since the first book. Since the first book, really? I know that it's been building since, no, I think you're right because they, okay, I might be misremembering because obviously this book has a million moving pieces or the series, but in the f first book when they first go into, they use the Waygate, not the Waygate, the stones, is that in the first book? I don't remember. But when, uh, I think it might be, maybe it's in the second book, when uh, Rand accidentally uses the the stone to go into the other world or whatever, I think they see the Tower of Genji in that world. That's mm -hmm. the first time that we were, like, introduced to that, I, I think. Um, Stubble makes shapes that I think it's funny that the Shan Chan Ogier soldiers are called gardeners. I want to talk about this, because I had a thought while reading this book about, especially at the end, because they talk about the gardeners. Um, one, I think it's interesting that the Shan Chan Ogier are soldiers because the Shan Chan on this side of the ocean are very like peaceful and like don't get involved in fights very often. Um, obviously they say that, you know, when they are involved in wars and stuff, they can be um, really good soldiers. So I kind of wonder if there's something different about those Ogier because the other thing 
is that the Ogier on our side of the ocean, they have to stay in settings all the time. Not all the time, but like, you know, they get the belonging and all that stuff and they have, they're like want to be in a setting, but like, it doesn't seem like the Ogier from the Shanchan have that because why would they cross an ocean? I mean, maybe they just assume there were settings over here. Are there settings in Shanchan? I don't know. So I was thinking about that. Like, are those Ogier somehow a little bit different? than the Ogier here because they, they've, I've never seen them talk about the studying. They seem more warlike than the Ogier that we're used to. So it's kind of interesting. Huh. Oh yeah. Uh, that's right. So the person who said the Tower of Genji was started in the first book, He's talking about how it was seen in the distance when they're floating down the river with Doman in book one. I forgot that was in book one. I thought for some reason that was in book two, but you know, the early books get all confused for me sometimes. Uh, but yeah, and so that's what Rant, that's what Matt is remembering the tower from too. So yeah, that did start all the way in the first book. Oh my that's God. So crazy. Like the way that he's planned out this series is just insane. It's pretty insane. Yeah. But yeah, it's really interesting all the details that the letter had in it, like the fact that there have to be three people, it has to be Matt and Tom for two of them, mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff. So then if Matt like were to be like, screw that, I'm not going, then it wouldn't work. It would fail, yeah. And Tom's like, well, if you don't go, I'm still gonna go. And I was like, no! So, I mean, I knew that Matt would agree to go, so yeah. I'm glad yeah, I it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that, how exactly that plays out and why, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll see why it is that Tom and Matt had to be two of the people. Right. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to, there's going to be something important that they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was interesting that Matt thinks that the eelfin are in his head and can see what he's doing. Like I get that they gave him his memories, but I wouldn't have interpreted that as like, they can see everything that I'm doing. So I don't think that's true. That's my phone telling me that someone's driving past my house. Oh, do you have ring like the doorbell thing? <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> Someone else, um, old Belk, sorry if I'm butchering your name, said it is strange that the Shantian Ogier do not seem to be tied to the studying and have no evidence of belonging. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking while reading this book. I was like, that's so weird. <laughs> Why would they be different? And like, if, if they were tied to the setting, I mean like that happened during the breaking is when they needed to be tied to the setting. Um, and the whole Arthur, Hawkwing leaving I happened after the breaking so it's like they were the same why would they even want to go across an ocean to begin with to go explore I don't know anyways it's it's interesting someone asked Ahmed asked how about Tylee Kurgan though the mutual respect she shares with Perrin in spite of their differences it's nice to see that was really cool I liked that they came to respect each other so that's the Shan Chan captain or whatever that was helping Perrin with um, getting Fael from the Shido. And she like, one, I love that she was a woman and she like had this military position. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And also she in the end is the one who captures Savannah. Savannah's like naked on her horse and Savannah starts talking. She like slaps her butt to get her to shut up. I thought that was so funny. and. <laughs> Savannah <laughs> deserves all the terrible things. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so going back to uh, Galena. So I knew that Galena was going to, um, what's it called? Betray Fayil. I mean, because obviously when she came back from Perrin capturing her, she didn't say anything to Fayil about seeing Perrin. So that was one thing. Um, and then I, I was excited that Fayil got her hands on the oath rod, but I was like, this is... This is not good. This isn't going to go well. And then Galena betrays them and traps them down in that basement or whatever, or that house that was falling apart. But in the end, Galena gets caught by Tharaba and like, she's going to go to the waste and be a prisoner forever. So I was like, heck yes. <laughs> I was so happy about that because I hate Galena with a passion. <laughs>
Someone said that they read in the world of Robert Jordan, which maybe that's like a book or something, like that explains a lot of world building stuff. Um, they that it said the Shan Chan Ogier were not separated from their studying for long, and as a consequence, don't suffer belonging. Hmm. How were they not separated if they were if they came across the ocean? I don't know. I haven't. There is like this really big book that it like is um, like an encyclopedia about like world building stuff for um, for the series, but I haven't read it yet. But maybe one day. That does sound really cool. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about Elaine's storyline. Um, she, you know, is trying to get her throne. She is dealing with being pregnant, which I thought some of the stuff about her, like how women who can channel have, um, are different when they're pregnant was like really interesting. Like the fact that they have a hard time channeling, they, they don't get nauseous, like they don't get morning sickness, but they get all these other symptoms. Um, I thought all that was really interesting. Oh, the Aiel take, um, what's her name? I'm totally losing names this morning. Um, the Aiel take the, the, her sister, what's her name? Who's oh, and sister, sister, Aiel sister. Avienda. That's her name. They take her away. I was like, no, because I love Avienda. I don't know where she went. Obviously, Rand had plans for her. Yes, thank you, Avienda. <laughs> Everyone in the chat's like, Avienda. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, they take her away, and I was sad that she like left, and I don't know where she is, and like we didn't see any points of view from her. So I guess we'll have to wait till the next book to see what she's up to. I also thought it was kind of interesting that Elaine has like, um, like she's not afraid of anything happening to her because men said that she would have the babies. And yes. Was, oh my gosh. She's like so set on that to the point where they go to try and capture the black Aja sisters. And I'm just like, this is the dumbest idea ever. Like, what are you doing? Like she just, she just knows that, that all she knows is that like, since she has, she's going to have the babies, according to men, she's, nothing's going to happen to her until she, whatever she wants. And oh that still seems kind of weird because when you catch wind of like, a uh, something that you know is going to happen from like a future thing that someone says, it could change for all you know. Like, yeah, <laughs> well, but men's things seem to come true no matter what. So I guess she's like hung up on that, but that doesn't mean you should go out and be reckless and do crazy <laughs> things. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was crazy that she wanted to go out there herself. Like, why couldn't she just send people and like stay in the palace? Um, and it just, it made everything worse because that's, it, it all went down when the people outside that were, besieging Camelin decided to attack on like the same day and Brigetta was like having to you know figure out how to handle all of that um so I gotta say that I was convinced for some reason that Van Deen was actually Black Audra and that she had killed her sister um I think kind of part of it was that she kept wearing her sister's clothes which I thought was like really weird I mean Maybe that's like a grieving thing that I've just never heard of, but she kept wearing her sister's clothes and I was like, she's actually, oh no, I thought, <laughs> I thought she was actually Adialis oh. and killed Van Deen and then like, I don't know, I had some crazy theory there that did not pan out <laughs> because apparently Carolina or whoever was actually the um, black sister and Van Deen like stabs her, which was awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. Graf said, I like the bonding aspect of when Elaine is pregnant with Brigitta. I'm not sure what you mean, Graf, like, because Brigitta can feel stuff? I don't know what you mean. Ahmed said, Elaine's handling of the Black Sisters is very annoying. Yes, I agree. It was so, st and the amount of people dying as a consequence is amazing. Yes, like, sisters died, those um, warders, their warders probably died, and then they have to go and get her 
um, from the wagon or whatever when they're trying to escape and a bunch of people die there. It's like all these people died because you were dummy. <laughs> I was about to cuss. I <laughs> was really annoyed. Like, she, was, I just, she did not make me happy. So. so, Cara said, yeah, I mean, the babies could have been born early, and then she could get killed. Yes. They could have tried to force her to do bad things. She could have. Okay. Someone said, Elaine's definitely my least favorite of Rand's lovers. I agree. I much prefer Min and Avienda. I do too. I liked Elaine a lot more at the beginning of the series, but I think that like um, Min and Avienda are like, they, they know what's up a lot yes. more. Yes. Yes. Oh, so Graf was talking about sharing her feelings. Effects are exaggerated because of the pregnancy. I don't think I realized that they were exaggerated because of the pregnancy. I didn't either. I assumed that that was just a like, a woman to woman bond thing that they could, but yeah, that's interesting that they're exaggerated because she's pregnant. Um, okay. So then, you know, Elaine gets saved and then they're able to, um, take back, like attack the other soldiers that were attacking. Like she went around to be behind them, which I thought was like a really smart military move. Um, and like that all worked out. And now she has all the people, all the houses that she needs to be able to be queen, which is really exciting. Finally, that took forever. <laughs> oh my God, it's already almost been an hour. Graham, we started a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, it was like 1030 before we, it was like half an hour went by before we even brought up the fact that Moraine wasn't dead. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked, any thoughts on Rodel Iturralde, one of the least appreciated characters in the series, in my opinion. Oh my so God. I don't know that much about him yet. Like I know we've seen from him a few times, but I'm I think in the towards the beginning of this book, he has gathered a bunch of Altarans and Domani and he's fighting against the Shan Chan. So I think I mean, it's so hard to know, like, to connect all the dots sometimes. So he's been fighting them, I think, also in Altara. So, like, at towards the end, when Matt's, when um, the Death Lost soldier is meeting with other Shan Chan and they're talking about all the different forces that are in Altara, I think a lot of those are actually Rodel Iturralde's forces. And that, but he thought that they were all Matt's or they, he thought they were all Tom Maryland's. <laughs> but I think we thought they were like all together, but I don't think that they actually were. I think that they're separate. Totally could be. Yeah. Someone said at this point, we barely know him. That's how I feel. But like sometimes I feel like that, but we've seen a character a few times and I just don't make the connection. So I'm glad. And that's that's so mentioned good. a lot, um, but I feel like we still know not, not that much about him. Cause I know yeah. in the audio book, they pronounce his name as Iteralda and oh, yeah. always makes me think of Icaramba. So every time. <laughs> <laughs> that is really funny. You know, like he gets mentioned like all the dang time and yet like, I don't really, I don't have that much of like an opinion about him. Yeah, and I don't understand exactly like where he came from. I mean, I think he, yeah, I don't really know, you know, what his role is, but I guess maybe he might play a bigger role in the next books, which is exciting. Um, speaking of audiobook pronunciations, in this book, they went back to saying Mogadine. <laughs> and I just, I, I have decided I like Mogadian, and I think that is the right pronunciation, but yeah, I, they went back to saying Mogadian in this book, and I was just like, seriously, guys, <laughs> move together. Yeah, I think I like Mogadian better, but that's because it was the first pronunciation. That you heard. And people can, you know, we we as human beings always can yeah. have yeah. familiarity yeah. with liking, and I know I totally do. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, it's it's crazy, like how, and then Sorilia versus Sorilia. Um, yeah, I like Sorilia. Yeah, and I like Sorilia because it's the first one they said. So <laughs> it's, like, it's always what happens, it's so weird. That's funny. Uh, Graf asked if we've talked about Matt and Tuan yet. Yes, we did already talk about them a little bit, but if you have anything specific you want to say about them, you can. Um, 
I said that they're my favorite. I love them. And I'm so glad that they're finally, oh, that actually reminds me, I had another theory that was disproved. <laughs> I had a theory that Tuan had already said out loud three times that she was married to Matt, just like not in front of Matt, and that they'd been married like this whole time and he didn't know it, but that didn't, <laughs> that didn't pan out. <laughs> that would be really weird. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that maybe she had said it to just her, her person, I can't remember her name right now, like in private, because I think you just have to hear it where like one other person can, can hear you. So I thought that like maybe she was already married to him but hadn't told him yet, but then at the end she says it, so. That would get so confusing because you could tell a different person every day. And <laughs> but but nobody would nobody know. know. <laughs> but I also love that like everyone, like the Sean Chan, I guess the Death Watch guy, and he had some people with him who were there when she said, like she finished the ceremony and said that Matt was her husband. Like they don't even know who this guy is and they just like accept, I mean, that's totally very Sean Chan way, but they're just <laughs> like, okay, so now you're the Prince of Ravens. Okay, <laughs> like they just, went with it without you know, like no questions no just like not even like who is this guy they're just like okay now you're the guy <laughs> <laughs> Sean Sini said wheel of time name pronunciation is a free-for-all I'm thinking about maybe doing a pronunciation video later and trying to say them correctly but also saying like this is what I thought it was or like this is what um, the audiobook narrators would say sometimes and like putting all putting it in video. I think that'd be fun. Um, someone said, I wonder how it would be said in the TV series. Apparently, Grab said Robert Jordan was not a fan of the audiobook pronunciations. I didn't know that. That's interesting. It might be totally different from like, like a lot of the pronunciations might be completely different from like yeah. either of the weird ways they say it. Yeah. And I noticed, especially in this book, so I always say Sidin and Sidar. And I've heard like Daniel Green say Saidin and Saidar. And I think maybe that is the right way to say it. And in this audiobook, they definitely were saying that I like as an extra syllable. And I have never said it that way. And I don't like it that way. <laughs> it could even, like, maybe for all we know, the emphasis might even be on the first syllable. So it might be siding or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shansani said that she pronounces Sorlia as Sor Ili. Like, she doesn't say the A at the end. Oh. Which is definitely a way to say it. <laughs> Uh, Graf said, I hate the Sean Chan, but Matt and Tuan are great. Yeah, and I'm really confused by the way that they part. First, I was, like, confused that they were just going to part ways like that. But they said something along the lines of, like, Matt was like, the next time I think I'm going to see the Sean Chan, it's probably going to be on the battlefield. <clears throat> um, and Tuan is like, yeah, you're my husband, but, you know, my main priority is still the Empire. So they're still, like basically saying they're gonna fight each other. Like, I was very confused about how that's gonna work when they're married. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> the chat's still talking about the um, pronunciations. Oh, someone said, I'm curious who's really pulling the strings in that relationship. Um, I think it kind of goes both ways between Matt and Tuan. I think Matt is ready to yield to her on some things, but I think Tuan also appreciates that he stands up to her because she's used to everybody doing everything that she says. So having someone actually stand up to her, I think is like refreshing and probably one of the things that is attractive about Matt to her. Graf said, I love that there are differences in pronunciations because in real life, there's always a mix of pronunciations. And I agree. Like when people try to correct me in my comments, like you said this wrong or whatever, I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to say them the right way, but like really it's just, you know, tomato, tomato, like it's just a pronunciation. Like it's not the end of the world. It's okay. <laughs> It's so true though. Like even with just names that we hear every day, People right. Yeah. There's just different ways to pronounce things and that's okay. Yeah. 
Well, we're probably going to be winding down soon. So anybody in the chat, if you have last minute things you want us to talk about, feel free to say them now. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat. I'm glad that there's so many people like chatting. It's, it's fun. <laughs> um, I am really excited to read the next book. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that happened in this book. I'm sure there's a million things that happened in this book that I wish we would talk about, but anything if I can remember. I feel like we talked about the main storylines. Yeah, we went through everything that I had notes yeah. about. So. Okay, good. Um, I actually didn't have notes prepared for this one. <laughs> I did because I knew I was going to end you up. You read it so early. I just finished it. I actually just finished it this morning. I read the last little bit this morning. So yeah. it was all very. There was one that I didn't actually have a copy of. So I knew I was going to be listening to the audiobook. And I mm -hmm. don't finish audiobooks very quickly at all anymore. Yeah. So it's like, this is going to take me the entire like two or three months. To <laughs> and it only ended up taking like two months. Um, even though I didn't listen to it over Christmas vacation or anything. Oh, yeah. Um, it still only took me like two months to listen to it. And so that surprised me. Yeah. So I definitely made, I definitely made Do you have a physical copy of the next one or is that on all audio too? Um, I do have a copy of the next one. The only other one I don't have a copy of is the last one. Oh, really? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Someone said, Stubble McShade said, I think it's funny that Matt is an unreliable narrator. I guess I never really thought about it that way, but yeah, he kind of is. I mean, he just, he says things the way he sees them, but he's not always right about things. Also, I thought that the um, revelation in this book that he had like multiple dice going in his head at the same time and like they were stopping individually was like really funny. Um, and actually, that reminds me about uh, Eludra and how she was making those cannons and she's calling them dragons and dragon's eggs. I thought that was really cool. And um, Matt's like, I know somebody who could really use these. And so when we leave the show, you should come with us. And she's like, who is it? And he says, the dragon reborn. And she at first like doesn't believe him, but then she's like, okay, I do believe you. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Graf said, it's interesting that Perrin and Fayil and Matt and Tuan have similar relationships. The women are wanting their men to stand up to them. I agree. And I think that is a little bit of Robert Jordan playing with um, stereotypes and like what people expect of women to be, you know, to want to, <clears throat> um, to not like stand up for themselves and uh, I guess not necessarily want to be controlled, but you know, they want someone who's going to give them a little bit of a challenge and to have such strong women. I think that's a little bit of Jordan kind of playing with those, uh, gender, gender stereotypes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Graf also asked if I've read this gathering storm before and yes, I actually, I was looking at an old, um, Goodreads account that I made like before I started doing this, uh, having my channel and stuff. And it says that I read book 13, but I don't know. I'm, I'm going to stick with just saying that I've read book 12 because like, I really don't remember, I guess once I finish book 12, I'll know for sure. Um, because like I said, there's a couple things that haven't happened yet that I know are going to happen, but so much of the stuff I, I don't remember. So it's, it's, they're like fresh reads. I just remember like one or two things that haven't happened yet. All right. Um, I think that that's it. Thank you to everybody who has joined us. This was a really fun live show. Um, our next live show was going to be for the Gathering Storm. It's going to be at the end of February or early March, depending on um, what the last day of February is. But it will be announced on both my channel and Roya's as usual. And the next one will be over on Roya's channel because we take turns hosting these. So thanks everybody who joined us and um, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.